Okay. Welcome back. First, I'd like to say just a few short things to kind of recapitulate what I was trying to get at this morning when speaking about compassion and the misery of others and the the misery of humanity and so forth. I think that the most important thing to consider in what I have suggested is that Our relationship to the misery of others, as it appears within our own consciousness, is fundamentally no different than our relationship with our own misery, as it appears in our own consciousness. The the, the recognition, the the, um, perception of the misery of others appearing in our consciousness, the fact that they make us uncomfortable or or uh, unhappy or confused or whatever the presence of that does to us um, is the same as the presence of our own misery in our own consciousness. It makes us unhappy and miserable and confused and uncertain what to do and and uh, full of the 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 certainty that something must be done. With the misery of others, as it appears, as with our own misery, we are, we assume, our unconscious and unexamined assumption is that the sensations that accompany that, the feelings that accompany that, the thoughts and so forth that cluster around it are harmful that they are, they don't belong here, and that uh, they may cause us damage. They may even be life-threatening in the sense that the presence of this confusion and ignorance is kind of spoils the life. And it's no different for our, our perception of the misery of others appearing in our consciousness than it is for our own. We accept that, of course, if we, if we are convinced that it's somebody else, somebody else who is causing the trouble, that makes it a little bit easier for us to try to dismiss it. But our inclination is the same in both cases. Our inclination is to either fix it or uh, make it go away. And as we begin to lose the sense of of uh, our own uh, ignorance and our own negativity as uh, harmful to us, and we begin to lose interest in trying to do something about it and trying to fix it or trying to make it go away, uh, the, that then we are assailed by we're in the presence of people who are confused and anxious and aggressive and, and, uh, and so forth, and we nevertheless assume that that's harmful to us, that that will hurt us, that that will cause us damage. Even though we've seen in our own case that our thoughts and our the sensations, the desires, the, the aversions and all of that cause us no harm, still we assume that when somebody else is around who's causing us difficulty, that that is harmful and that they should go away. They're interfering with the further flowering and development of our own wonderful realization. But the fact is that the misery, the thoughts, the confusion, the ignorance of others are exactly the same as ours. They cause us no trouble. They actually hurt nothing. They are nothing more than thought. They come and go like all thoughts, and there is no need to follow the inclination to fix them or make them go away. They are just part of the parade of phenomena. And of all the things that I said, I think this is the most practical 
uh, aspect for you to take under consideration. There's no need to, to get rid of the people that are, by our own lights, uh, damaged or, or stupid or aggressive or arrogant or, or ignorant or any of those other things. They don't hurt us. They really don't. No more than our own stupidity hurts us. Really doesn't. The solution to the perception of of uh, harm done by the, the presence of the misery of others is the same as the solution to our own misery and ignorance. It is to get to the root of the problem, not to try to fix the manifestation, the expression, the presentation of the problem, which is whatever it is that's occurring, but to get to the root of the problem and to be helpful and not harmful. This business of compassion is extremely difficult to, to be clear about, to be clean about. It's extremely difficult. It is, it is in, the, in the nature of our indoctrination and our training and our uh, the acculturation, to think of compassion as being some lovey-dovey, warm, gentle welcoming of, uh, of the afflicted soul. And, of course, that's not the case. That's something, one of the strategies that we deploy to try to fix it or make it go away. Compassion is the, the present and vivid experience of misery when in the presence of people who are suffering, whether they know it or not. And the solution is the same. I'd like to say a few things now about, and really very few things, there's not much to say about this, but I'm going to probably say much more than needs to be said, since that's kind of my style. And that is, uh, I want to talk just a little bit about the uh, relationship between the teacher and the spiritual aspirant, between the teachings and the spiritual aspirant. Now, my own sense of my own work in my own sense of my own work and my own place in this thing, I don't think of myself as a teacher, nor do I think of this, what, I, uh, what I suggest to you and bring to you and offer to you as a teaching. Mostly I think of myself as kind of uh, bearing witness to the fact of the matter, to the actual case, which is that it's human nature to be alive and happy and content that is not natural for us to be discontented and dissatisfied with our life. And that the, the, uh, I tell you from my own experience that it is absolutely, it's possible, it is easy, it is clear, and it is uncomplicated to rid ourselves of that, that sense that life sucks. It's really easy. But I think of myself as kind of bearing witness to that, to the fact of it, to the, fact that human nature is happiness and contentment. For all of the time that we have as this species been trying desperately to find an answer to what seems to be the, the insoluble issues of human existence, the great uh, contradiction between what we want and what life actually offers and uh, and so forth, we have, we have come to teachers. We have come to people who, by their demeanor and by their, their, uh, their presence, uh, pro- give us a sense of trust and uh, confidence that the, that the advice and the, the practices that they offer are genuine and will give us help. Now, that's perfectly sane. 
It's a perfectly sane thing. What becomes insane and infantile is the fact that our inclination also is to completely surrender to the idea that the teacher and the teaching contain the truth that we need in order to be free of confusion and misery in our own life. And that is our responsibility to do nothing other than receive what is offered to us and to accept without question whatever the teacher or the teaching suggests to be the case. This is the way we have done it for many thousands of years. Somebody appears who seems to be clean and clear and, and full of light and, and, and quietude, and we cluster around them. Master, Master, tell us what we must do. Give us the boon. Give us what we need. Master, Master, why? Well, how can I be like you? How can I get what you have? And this is the model that we've followed. And it's not the fault of the teachers. It's not the fault of us. It's the fault of the, all of us. In truth, we take captive the teacher and require that the teacher and the teaching have a certain authoritarian uh, certainty about it. We take captive the teacher and the teaching and we're not interested in it unless the teacher and the teaching will give us what we want with very little effort on our own part. There are some exceptions, some apparent exceptions to that in the more strenuous practices like in Zen Buddhism and, and some other aspects of Buddhism and Vipassana and things of that nature in which we are expected actually to endure pretty extreme discomfort and... Uh, and uh, abnegation in exchange for the boon of enlightenment, the boon of feeling good, the boon of happiness. But we see that the teacher and the teachings are something different from us. There's something that has arisen magically in the history of humankind and somehow mysteriously in a way that we can't imagine are different from us. They have broken through into a whole different realm of existence. And it's only from them that we can get what we seek. It's only from the, the full comprehension of what they say and what they offer that we get what we seek. And this has been pretty much a failure. It hasn't been very successful, this model of grouping around a teacher, of kind of worshiping a teacher and a teaching. Not just a teacher, but a teacher. What's clear to me, and it's clear to me now, although it wasn't always the case, like when I was struggling to make some teacher give me what I wanted and, and uh, alert and always on guard to make to watch every facial expression or lift of the eyebrow or whatever, to determine whether I was on the right track or not on the right track. In those days, it wasn't so clear to me. But having gone through that and having somehow by sheer luck, sheer luck kind of hit the lottery, it's very clear to me now that the actual proper relationship between teachings and spiritual aspirants, or human aspirants really, is first of all, uh, attitude toward the teachings of kind of, not skepticism, but the application of intelligent discernment to take nothing as if it were dropped from the sky and it must be accepted in the form that you hear it or in the form that it is uttered. The, the teachings and the teachers themselves are human, just like you. Exactly the same. They come from the same insanity that you come from. And they are nothing special, really. Nothing special. So, first of all, it is, in my view, critical that uh, we approach teachers and teachings with a, with a healthy, well, skepticism. A healthy willingness to 
to be uh, intelligent about what we see to be the case, to not take anything as revealed truth simply because it drops on the lips from some teacher or arises from some ancient manuscript. We can rely on our own common intelligence, our own human capacity for discernment, and our own ability to distinguish between fancy and fact, and should. The idea that we should abandon our capacity for discernment is stupid, really. Stupid. The other thing is, and the, the, the thing that is at the core of this, uh, of this, uh, of what I'm trying to communicate now, is that no matter how clean, no matter how clear, no matter how true any teaching or any teacher may be, no matter how wonderful, no matter how absolutely down the line, absolutely right any teacher or teaching may be, no matter how obvious it is to your to you in applying your capacity for intelligence and discernment, no matter how obvious it is to you that what's being spoken rings true and must be the case, no matter how true that might be, you must do it for yourself. I can't, and it's, it seems like that's obvious, but it's not so much in, the war, in actual practice. You must do it for yourself. You must attain the fruit of this work on your own. It's a, it's a, it's, 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 in a sense, it's a, it's a little paradoxical. But the fact is that you are absolutely alone in the approach to this possibility of being finished with misery and suffering in your own life. You are absolutely on your own. I stutter and stammer and try with all my heart the best I can, and I I work on it at home, and I work on it mostly in these meetings with you, because your conversations with me draw out of me uh, uh, a, you know, a more developed presentation of what it is I'm trying to offer. But there's nothing I can say that is actually the case. Nothing. I can approximate. I can, I can do metaphorical uh, work. I can, I can speak about what it is that's the, what it is that is the case. I can talk about what I see to be true. But that doesn't give you anything. The only thing that you can get from me is the encouragement and the, the awakening of your own natural curiosity that will cause you to do this work yourself. Nothing else will do. Nothing. There is no free lunch, <laughs> actually. There, there is no easy uh, bestowing of, if I could... If, uh, if it was in my power to wave my hand and have everybody free of uh, confusion about their actual nature, I would have done so long ago, ten years ago. It's not in my power. It's not in the Buddha's power. It's not in Ramana's power. It's not in anybody's power to free you from your own misunderstanding. You must do it yourself. You must. Now it happens that this this view of things is very kind of American in its uh, in its feel and its thing. It's the kind of the self reliance of Emerson and the transcendentalists. You must you're in this on your own, which seems to contradict what I said this morning about us all being in this together, but not so. In this movement, for you to rid yourself of the the sense that there's something wrong, the sense that something needs to be fixed, you're entirely on your own. As is every individual human being, 
even if we manage to reach every individual human being, and even if every human being that we reach actually is is inspired and and uh, encouraged to to uh, to try this, every human being is absolutely on their own in this work. No one's there with you, ever. It's you. It's all you. So, uh, so there. I don't know how to speak of that more clearly, more bluntly, more cleanly. You have to do this for yourself. I, for, um, for my part, I am absolutely available to you. Carla is absolutely available to you. I wish to help you in any way I possibly can. I will bend over backwards and twist myself in knots to the, whatever extent is necessary to try to provide some, some help, some dispersing of uh, confusion or, or misunderstanding or false assumptions. But all that is nothing. It's nothing. It gives you nothing. You must see yourself for yourself. You're on your own. You must see yourself for yourself. And uh, as I said, I think in the beginning of this retreat, the fact that we gather together here and in many spiritual venues, we gather together and there is a you know, a feeling of uh, common purpose and, and uh, common viewpoints and a common sense of uh, what we're about. And there's a feeling of, uh, you know, I, I don't know, pleasantness, I guess, uh, warmth and camaraderie. That's not, that's not a feature. It's more a bug. Really. You must do this on your own. And uh, there's no, there's nothing wrong with uh, with uh, feelings of warmth and friendship and camaraderie and all of that. But the, the inclination in my experience, especially in spiritual circles, is to substitute that feeling of contentment and satisfaction to be in a in an environment that is that is conducive to your own uh, feelings and so forth, is this tendency to see that as being the necessary and sufficient condition for something to happen to you. I tell you it's not. It is a distraction. Not bad. Doesn't have to be done away with. Just see it for what it is. The heart and soul of this entire teaching or offering or whatever in the world it is that I am trying to do here, the heart and soul of it is is you, singularly, you. You looking at you, not me looking at you, not me telling you what you are, but you looking at you, alone, by yourself, without regard to the teachings without regard to the atmosphere, without regard to the environment. You looking at you. Okay? So anybody wants to talk, I'll be happy to talk with you. <clears throat> and I'm out of things to say. Yes. Hi. What's your name? My name's Michelle. Hi, Michelle. I'm happy to meet you. I'm nervous sitting up here. You have to hold the microphone up. You know, the reason, by the way, I, I just want to say, 
you know, the reason for asking people to do this in the microphone is not for your sake or my sake, but for the sake of the, the people who are going to see and hear this in the future. Because these videos and so forth, they end up like everywhere. It's astonishing we, the thing, how these things get out. And, uh, and it's good for them to be complete. That's why I ask you to hold the microphone up. Can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think I have two questions. One is I want clarity on it's the me looking at me. Or I'm not so sure that it's... I know something's happening, but I'm not so sure. Okay. And you seem to say it's very clear when you see that. I, if I seem to say that, it's not what okay. I'm saying. In fact, it is often the case that you don't even know it's happened. That's kind of what I think is happening. Yeah. And like I, I, I said that today, and I say often, that the critical element is the recognition which is why attention is so important, not just the accidental stumbling upon reality, but intention. But that recognition isn't always immediately seen for what it is, because the, and the reason for that is really very simple. You know, these aren't mystical, magical things. It's not like, like uh, it's because God is perverse or something that you don't immediately recognize the fact that you've recognized yourself. It's because you are so uninteresting. You know? I mean, really. <laughs> really. See, attention arises in order to protect you. Or to give you, you know, to, to keep a watchful eye on what's happening so you can be, you can identify what's bad, you can identify what's good, you can try to find ways to get rid of what's bad and hold on to what's good. That's the purpose of this arising attention, this this urge to define and discern, right? to see and to look for, the, so that it's, it, it is, its nature is to seek after things that are in motion, things that are moving or making noise or you know, somehow attracting attention. That's why we call it attracting attention. You don't have any of those characteristics. Those characteristics arise from you. They're kind of like your face. But you, the actual nature of you, is pretty much empty of any characteristics at all. So, so attention doesn't naturally rest there. But it can touch that. I, I've been having intention on that attention for yeah. a long time. Yeah. I just didn't, it doesn't look like me. Um, I tapped into something, I just don't know what that is. Uh, describe it to me. Um, I like the words empty, um, nothingness. That's you. That's you. Um, That's you. But it doesn't look like me. <laughs> <laughs> um, it doesn't look like what you're or, accustomed to. Or like true nature. Um, what it, the emptiness. Yeah, but um, say, listen to me. Follow But this. the unis of you words that you use, Yeah. that feels like it. Yes, that's it. But when you look at you, when you look at this, when, like when I speak about finding the you-ness of you, that leads you to your nature. That's the direct route into your nature. That would be the print on the paper? That's, uh, that's interesting. Not exactly, but yes. Yes. But it's the, like one thing on a piece of paper. It's the, it's the first thing that comes up in the paper. That's you. The reason that you feel like emptiness in the effort to see your actual nature is because what you're seeing is absence. The absence of qualities, the absence of movement, the absence of color, the absence of light, the absence of sound, because there's none of that to you. All of that is what arises from you. And attention is geared to look at all of that. So when you get a glimpse of yourself, the actual reality of you, what you see is pretty much nothing, which is what has given rise in the teachings to the, the viewpoint that you are empty, that you are inexistent, and all of the other things that come up in the teachings. But the fact is 
that you are, of course, here. I mean, there's nothing about which you can be as certain as your own presence here. That's a fact. And when you, when you touch the, the actual hard nature of your being, of your, of you, don't say, please erase being. I, I, that word is fraught. When you touch this actual nature, you see nothing. Nothing. You look at you and see nothing. So the, the, the time, the duration that attention spends there is like that. Like that. Less than that. And then it skitters away, looking for something interesting to look at, because you're not very interesting, right? <clears throat> right. Well, the good news is that contrary to what we would expect based on our, our, our experience with spiritual matters and spiritual aspiration and all of that stuff, contrary to what we would expect, the duration of the actual contact of attention with reality is irrelevant. Really. The, I can't the, wait for that. It's irrelevant. <laughs> that doesn't matter. It is the looking that does all the work. And it may take a long time or a short time for its effects to be begin to become manifest, but it is certain that that's what will occur. So is my attention in the right place? Sounds like it to me. Okay. If you look for the unis of you uh -huh. and you end up at nothing, uh -huh. that's exactly what I would expect. Okay. Okay. And I, I definitely recognize shifts and changes that have been happening. Yeah, right. That's, and that's really the confirming. It's more, more that subtraction. Subtraction. Thing. That's right. Things just don't show right. up. Things don't make me react like they used to. Right. That's it. That's exactly right. And it is subtraction. And, it, and sometimes you don't even notice it. Yeah. You know, because it just doesn't show up. It's no big deal. This is the amazing thing about this. It's no big deal. We make it a really I'm big kind of deal. I'm about that. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> I'm just talking a little bigger. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you wait and see. It's, uh, it's just no big deal. The subtraction of these negative experiences and negative traits doesn't mean a thing. They just don't show up. They are just not here. How could that be a big deal? Okay, my second question. Um, when overwhelming feelings come up, which they do regularly, um, they're very negative. It feels almost a lot of times like I want to die. Not like I want to kill myself, but right. I'm like done with this world. <laughs> I, like right. I don't have any interests. Um, it's just it gets overwhelming. And it's like the feelings are before the emptiness, I think. No. Or I just sit in the feelings because I don't have, know what else to do. I, I'm done running from them. Well, that's or good. Or being distracted. I just stay and sit. They can't hurt you, Michelle. Way. They can't hurt you, Michelle. It's not fun. <laughs> it, it, it not being fun can't hurt you. Really. It hurts. It can't. Are you, have you changed? Has that, has that, has that nothing changed? No. Of course not. Can't hurt you. Nothing whatsoever can hurt you. Nothing whatsoever can help you. The, the, the appearance of this life is a, is a magnificent arising. It's really incredible. It's unbelievable that it should occur, that there should be a, a creature conscious of its own existence facing the world. It's just incomprehensible. The characteristics and traits and so forth, all of these things that concern you are sensations. That's all they are. It's energy? Just energy. It's just sensation. And the mind's like, wah, 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 wah. That's right. And because, because the mind has a duty, 
that was imposed upon it in the moment of the birth of self-consciousness. And that duty is to protect you or to make you better so you can get the promise of life instead of the, the horror of life. The purpose that is given to the mind is to identify what's good, identify what's bad, find a way to hold on to the good, and get rid of the bad. So any, you know, it doesn't ever work. That's right. <laughs> it's true. That's discernment. So the the uh, sensational arising appears. And the truth is that sensation is pretty much all the same. Really, it's pretty much all the same. So is this a process that's going to shift and move on? Am I going to reach the end of this, or do I have to do this the rest of my it'll, life? It'll, the... <laughs> the uh, the inclination, the perceived need to dispose of this state that appears within you mm-hmm. will just not show up. Okay. Right? I promise? I promise. It'll just not show up. Just like other things you've noticed just don't show up anymore. Yeah. This too. This it's perceived... Big, though. This, <laughs> it's not big. It's just a sensation. Big. Really. The sensation is being is misunderstood. The mind, which is charged with the duty to protect you and enhance you, misunderstands that sensation because it appears in a certain context and thinks that it's a really bad thing. That's all this happens. So should, am I just supposed to just stay with it? The only thing you can do ever do... I have a do, choice? The only thing you can ever do is look at you. And looking at that is me? When it's happening? Or am I, no. Or am I looking? Am I looking for that empty place? Look for that. Look for you. Always look for you. We remember that the arising of any negative experience, any negative sensation, provides an opportunity that points right back to you. Because you're the it. you're the one that experiences. It dissolves that. a lot of the time, not all the time. <clears throat> yeah. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Can't hurt you. It consumes a lot of my life, it seems. It takes a lot of energy from uh, how, me. And, and how, how is that? How is that? What energy does it take? How can a sensation take energy? Um, I sensation feel, I feel is tired energy. all the often yeah. from this. It seems to be my main focus, or everything just seems to keep bringing me back to this. Or there's no running or distractions that are interesting anymore. I just want to focus on this. Thank you. It will pass. This too shall pass. <laughs> yes, it will pass. I can't, I cannot, I have no advice to offer you as to how to ameliorate or solve or, or cure this that seems like an affliction because I know so clearly that it is not an affliction. Okay, I'll you. It's not. But I have to find out for me, right? Of course you do. I can't get it. And I totally feel like I'm all in this all by myself. I get that. Yeah. I've been in it long <laughs> enough to know it's just me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You. Stay in touch. <laughs> okay. okay. Let me know. <clears throat> all of you, stay in touch. Really. I can't say that often enough. Stay in touch. Let me know. I may not be able to respond immediately to emails or, you know, things like that, because (laughs) there's only so many hours in a day. But it is extremely helpful to me to hear from you. And, And if anyone is helped by this work, it is also extremely helpful to anybody that's helped by this work for me to hear from you and help me become clearer. And more to the point, cleaner. Who else? (coughs) 
Now I know your name. Rebecca. Rebecca. Fred and Rebecca. That's it. Hi. Hi. Thank you, Michelle. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Everything you said is exactly how I feel. Exactly. It's amazing. Anyway. So, emptiness... um, At times it appears as if emptiness is sustained over a period of time. And I want to make sure that that's what it is, as opposed to maybe just being spaced out over a period of time. Can I say one thing first of all? I'm, I'm not talking about emptiness. I'm telling you that the reason that the whole idea of emptiness arises is because when you look at you, what you see is absence. It doesn't mean empty, that emptiness is the actual, is your nature. Your nature actually is full. It is full of your own expression, which is this life and the thoughts and the movements and all of that. So it's not emptiness that you're seeing. This is a spiritual trope that really is kind of off the mark, as all metaphors are. You are, what you see when you look at you is absence. The absence of movement, the absence of color, the absence of sound. And it's easy to interpret that as emptiness or the void or other really juicy kind of, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, terrifying things. But it's not emptiness. And, and go, so go on. Well, I'm just noticing that there are extended period of, periods of time where uh, there's no momentum to do anything or no, no momentum to move towards something. Mm-hmm. And that can be somewhat problematic when I'm at work at 9 o'clock in the morning and you know I have 10 things in front of me that I have to do. The momentum just doesn't appear sometimes. And then also... There are periods where I'll be in a room or in a situation or in an environment where there's not a recognition of where I am in space and in time. And, you know, it's just, there's just not a recognition. And, and that can bring about some confusion. I mean, you, you don't have a recognition. Right. Of where, yeah. Right. And so at times it, Some time will pass, and then I will interpret that. And I'll say, oh, I was just spaced out, or, you know, something's wrong with me, I have dementia, or something like that. So I'm trying to kind of see, maybe I am just spaced out, or maybe there is some dementia there. I'm just trying to, to differentiate. I don't know, is that... Should I try and phrase it differently? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I do not seem to be demented to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, I'm not an expert on these matters, so it's, you know, I, you could be demented for all I know. <laughs> but that's not a problem. What you describe, however, is very familiar to me. And, in fact, the, the lack of... Uh, the lack of motivation, the lack of impulse to do things uh, uh, was a very large part of my own experience for, for a lot of years since in, in this work. It was, it's only in the last couple of years that I really kind of caught fire about the possibilities that are present here and how this is something that's really new, really different, and that it actually works. For a long time, I had little interest in doing anything. All I really wanted to do was just kind of sit there and contemplate my navel or whatever. That passed. The, 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 thing to, the thing that I think is useful to see about this is that, first of all, everybody, every, every, every human, individual human creature is unique. The characteristics, the traits. We have a lot of systems that we've 
have brought into place over the years, trying to categorize uh, different personality types and, and Enneagram types and, and all kinds of other things. But the fact is that every human being is unique. It's just too complicated a creature to be easily boxed into a, 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 a type. So there's no predicting that I can see, and in, in, in what I'm speaking of now is my own experience with the people that I have been working with for this time. There's no predicting. I have seen very clearly that there are those who, for whom this produces little really dramatic change at all. It's just a, a falling away of the sense that something's wrong and a, a contentment in being at home in their own skin and so forth. And there are others, uh, more like me, although I'm kind of at the extreme of the other end, there are others more like me who fought and struggled and and uh, went crazy trying to get free. And uh, the, 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 the period of the kind of stabilization of the the effect of this work has been a very long time in my case. It took me a very long time to come to the point where I even, uh, I mean, I could see that I was different. I could see that. I could see, for example, it used to be when I was, uh, <clears throat> when I was a young man and stupid and, you know, out gambling and playing cards and robbing banks and doing all that stuff. It used to be that the approach of a of a crisis in my circumstance, like like I was out of money, and the bills were due or the rent was due, it used to drive me into a frenzy of uh, of uh, escape. You know, I would just escape. I'd go somewhere else, do something else, try to get rid of it. I was driven crazy by it. I didn't know how. I did not have the skills, the kind of skills that are ordinarily uh, developed over a period of time, uh, over normal life, the kind of skills to plan ahead, to, you know, like uh, know that I had to work for a living and collect a paycheck. And it was, it was like everything was immediate. It was immediate, had no connection to anything. Like all of a sudden there I was on the edge of disaster and had no idea how I had gotten there, so I would escape from that and run to something else and then be okay for a little while until it caught up with me and I'd be on the edge of disaster again. It wasn't very long after kind of hitting the lottery, as I'm calling it, although it doesn't shower you with cash immediately. It doesn't shower you with cash at all. that uh, I noticed that something had changed and that although there still were times and not so much due anymore to my irresponsibility and inability to, you know, to do things, but just due to the circumstances and the nature of our condition and so forth, where I would find that the rent was due and we didn't have any money. And I would recognize very plainly that same energy of the need to do something about this, that this is something terrible, and I have to escape from this. I, not so much escape from the lack of the rent money, but escape from this horrible feeling of humiliation and, uh, and worthlessness and, and stupidity. Right? I could recognize that from the past, but it didn't mean anything to me. It just stopped having any, any meaning to me. It, it just was something that came and and then it passed, and I remained the same. And and as it happens, the rent always managed to get paid, and things have continued to kind of bump along for the last period. I'm using that as a particular example, but it was it continues to be the case that I am taken by surprise by the appearance of the effects of this work, by the act, actual comprehensive nature of the, of the uh, shift that has occurred here. Now others, as I said, it's much different. 
There's no way of predicting how that's going to go. But here's what's for certain. All of these characteristics, all of these traits, what they used to call vasanas, all of these uh, behavioral patterns, these behavioral habits, these uh, habits of identification, the habits of discernment, and this is good, this is bad, how do I get this, how do I get rid of that, and all of that. All of these things are effects, including this rising of this sluggishness and lethargy. and, and These are effects. They are not causes of anything. They are effects of the underlying disease of the misunderstanding about our actual nature and this sense that there is something wrong that has to be fixed. Now, these effects don't always uh, directly seem to... to uh, the, the, the relationship between the sense that something's wrong that needs to uh, be fixed and the the actual effect that it produces isn't always uh, all that clear. I mean, how can lethargy protect you? Well, lethargy is a method of denial. It's a method of withdrawal and and so forth. It's just one more uh, behavioral habit or behavioral trait that appears, stimulus response, it's all stimulus response. In a certain context, this particular trait will appear because it has appeared in that context before, and so far, you're still here. Therefore, let's not take a chance. Let's go ahead and get this in place. Right? So none of these things are of any consequence. I mean, they may seem to have great consequence while they're present, but in truth, they're of no consequence. They are old strategies that no longer have a reason for existing. In the past, like me, we have tried to get rid of these things. We have known that these things are bad, even though they arise in in, uh, response to the call to to serve you, to serve your safety and, and keep you from knowing how terrible life is or whatever it is. Even though they arise in that, we have also known the other the other uh, things that we are constantly monitoring tells us that this feels bad. This is one of the things that has to go. There's something wrong here. This means there's something wrong. And I have to make this go. And that's all that happens. And we never succeed in making it go. It stays for as long as its lifespan is, and then it vanishes. Never, you know, and then it comes back again in response to a similar, similar context and stimulus. Now, the outcome of this work is that the the cause of that effect begins to be snuffed out, begins to kind of dissolve. And as the cause of that effect begins to dissolve, the effect will still be in place because it's just there. It's just a conditioned response. There's nothing to be done about it until finally it just doesn't show up again. And just as prior to entering this work, you or anyone else is unable to do anything about the things that we think are harmful to us, the thoughts and desires and aversions and so forth that are harmful to us, you can't do anything about them now either. It doesn't give you any power over these mechanical devices that have sprung up over, you know, over the years in context. But they will pass. They will. The need for them has vanished, and they will pass. And for some, it takes a long time. For some, it takes a short time. And I can't tell you, for the life of me, what makes the difference. But that's what is, as clearly as I can relate it, that's what's actually occurred. And and it's often the case not always, but often the case that the the gradual eating away of the cause, the gradual eating away of the the belief that there's some problem here, somehow actually uh, results in a period of real craziness. You know, real uh, like, oh my God, I can't get what's going on. I can't get out of here. This is terrible, and I can't explain what that why that is so but it was so for me. 
And it has been so for others that I have known. And it may also be so for you. Sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. And what to do? It's, uh, you just wait. Well, another thing that's been happening is that a deep-rooted fear that I've had for as long as I can remember has gotten really, really exacerbated in my life. In other words, the circumstances in my life are such right now that it's just triggered. It, it, everything is perfectly aligned. Yes, the whole right. universe is aligned right now to trigger this particular fear in me so that it is so in my face. It is it's just unbelievable. And it's the most frightening experience that I've ever, ever had. And it's, it's, it's sustained and it's been going on for weeks and weeks and it's like there's no ex- there's just no escaping it because nothing there's no escape mechanism that's sufficient enough to get away from it it's like a monster coming in my face and uh anyway i find that interesting but There, it, it, it's easy sometimes to look at myself in the face of that. And I've noticed sometimes that there is a, a looking that's going on simultaneously when this is really, really there. And, there and, and I can see, sometimes I can see that that which is arising <clears throat> is energetic. It's, it's almost like it's just very, very dense, thick energy. I don't know. It's an interesting experience. Can't hurt you. I promise you, it can't hurt you. The, the and and the and it's like I've been talking this weekend in particular about the fact that it's the first time I've really talked about this as as directly as I have during this retreat about the fact that this uh, wild this this wild need to search for a solution, to search for an answer, to search for an escape. This is a feature, it's not a bug. It's justifiable. We are we feel trapped and and uh, at the mercy of the horror of our lives. And uh, so the arising of this wild energy seeking a way out, seeking escape, seeking something to do, something to fix, something to get rid of and so forth, is although it has been spoken of in spiritual circles as the cause of the problem itself, it too is an effect. And it's a justifiable arising. It is, it's not the, the urge to search for a solution or an escape that's wrong. It's just the, our understanding of what it is we're trying to find or get rid of that's wrong. And it doesn't do us any good when we're trying to escape from this cloud of fear, or we're trying to escape from lethargy, or we're trying to escape from ignorance, so it doesn't do any good because there's nothing to do about those things. But it's precisely that energy that is demonized in the spiritual community that is used in this work by directing it the only place that it can actually accomplish its purpose, which is to... the the perception of your actual nature. That, and I say that because the, as this fear arises, it, it like all other negative experiences, you know, I could tell you until the cows come home that this doesn't hurt, that it's just sensation and so forth, and you could agree with me until the cows come home and would do no good. There's still uh, irreducible conviction that there's something wrong when this thing is present. The, but the, it provides an opportunity, as you kind of indicated, provides an opportunity to look in the opposite direction at the one who is affected by this. It provides an uh, opportunity and it can be used to, to good purpose in that regard. So in a way it's a blessing. In a way it is, right. It points directly at you. You know, we 
We try to look around and we try to get rid of it. We try to dissolve it and all that. We can dissolve things, but they always come back. But where it really is pointing is directly at you. Directly at you. Which gives a, gives an opportunity. Well, thank God. <laughs> yeah. Is that helpful? Okay. Hi, Ed. Hi, John. Um, so having some thoughts about the I and the me, and I was feeling some, I don't know, muddiness or whatever last session yeah. or whatever. Yeah, it's pretty complicated. <laughs> and, but you mentioned just in this session, um, you said something like birth of self consciousness. And I'm th- you know, I'd heard around the age of two, this sort of normally happens. And um, to me, that. I would call that the birth of the me. <clears throat> you could call it that. Okay, and uh, um, I had at one of your gatherings that to me it was significant insight. I, some guy was sitting up with you, and I I mentioned this to you once, but anyway, um, <clears throat> saying you you were saying to him, happiness comes, happiness goes unhappiness comes, unhappiness goes. And then it what it just dawned on me that that, that implies a me that that happens to. Yes, it does. And I just start, and, and then it also dawned on me that the me is a fiction, that it doesn't exist. And I just started to chuckle. So, you know, it's, maybe this is what the late Ramesh would call a free sample or something. Uh, but, so, Okay, so if um, it's it's the me that that is happy is and, and suffers, but no, you 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 are not happy and you do not suffer. But I'm not me. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I am I. What else? When how? What is the difference between me and I? May I ask? <laughs> I use them interchangeably when speaking no, about myself. No, the me, the me does not exist. The me is a fiction. It is. It it, 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 it was created, and you know, changed its identity and defended itself and sought pleasure and blah blah blah. To this day, I mean, at, starting at the age of what two? Well, you know, we'll say. So that's. How can something that comes and goes, it's a fiction, be what I am? If you are, if you are calling the, uh, the perception that something is wrong and needs to something done about it, me, then that's true. But I wouldn't call it me. I, I, to me, it's just a misunderstanding. I, 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 and me are interchangeable. I just don't. You, I, I just, yeah, you I, is also interchangeable with those two. I just, I just, I just don't see it that way. What I'm, what I'm thinking of is like the Upanishads, uh, with you know, the two birds are sitting on a limb. Yeah, one's yeah, eating yeah, the yeah, yeah. sweet and bitter fruits of life, and the other's yeah, impassive. Love that at, one. The looking Mundaka. Yeah, yeah, I okay, love that. Okay, the one. one bird is the eye, and the yeah, other one's right. the meat. You. Don't, you like these things are really interesting, and but no, I I bring it up because that's practical. Like, like in the same way, like I find the the uh, what's that TV show that we like a lot? Uh, Fringe. Fringe. Fringe is one. I'm, I find that really interesting too, and this is interesting in the same way. But it has nothing to do with you. You are here. The 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 need to have some uh, coherence with some imagined idea is is okay, it can't hurt you, but it has nothing to do with you. You are here. You are unaffected by any of it. Yeah. I, That's what I want you to look at. I don't well, care what well, you well, call the, yourself. What the you know, the suffer it's the suffering I mean as long what I'm I guess one thing I'm trying to say is that as I see my true nature, identify with it, discover it, re- recognize it. That's not anything I'm asking. That's not what I'm asking. That's not what I'm suggesting. When you say look at, look at you. Not in order that you can see your true nature. 
Not in order that you can identify with it. Not in order that you, there is any effect whatsoever upon you from that. In order that you can bring the misunderstood energy of searching and trying to fix in direct contact with its object. With the thing that it believes that it seems to be protecting and serving. That's all. And the, I tell you, and, and I, I, I can't say this clearly enough, the need to reconcile what it is that I am saying with the, utter, the spiritual utterance of the past is beside the point. It, I am not speaking in those terms. Those things have been of no use to us. If they were of use to us, we would not be on the edge of extinction now. They have been around for thousands of years and have been of no use to us. Uh, I, it just sort of boggles my mind. I, I mean, I, I, maybe I'm just I'm missing not getting at it's all okay. what, what you're, what it's you're okay. saying. It's okay. It's okay. It really because is okay. This seemed to me pretty clear that, you know, the, I know. This, this, I it's know. like this personality, you know, that's identified with, it's like, I mean, that it's just sort of, you know, as you say, there's just sort of like, it has less and less, you didn't say this exactly, but less and less effect, you know, kind of fades. And, and then I, th- what I am, then that, that comes more to the, to the foreground. It, no, you know, I'm not, not going to quote, I'm going to quote this argument. Yes, and that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm yeah. saying. What I am saying, let me, let me try yeah. to be clear. I mean, and you went from what? Being, you know, miserable and ignorant, let's say, to not being that way. I mean, it's like, it's almost like there are two selves there. I so mean, I'm trying, I'm kind of making a distinction between the two or trying to, you know, yeah. not saying they're the same, but you're saying, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> let, let me try, okay? And, and don't ever hesitate to, to speak to me, okay? Don't ever think that I don't want to hear what you have to say, okay. because I do want to, hear when you, want to hear what you have to say, because I want to talk to you. Let me try this, okay? If you can disregard everything you understand about your nature, everything you have read and heard about your nature, and about the problem, and about the solution to the problem, and about what, how that solution arises, and what form it takes. If you can just disregard that for a second and just look at you. That's all. That's the whole of what I suggest. I don't say that you need to dispose of your allegiance to those ideas. I don't say that they are right or wrong. I don't say that you need to believe something new. I don't say anything like that. I just say that those ideas and and constructions are beside the point to what I am suggesting. All I am suggesting is that you look at you, this you that is ever-present. Just look there. Just that. And the the, the inclination to, uh, to uh, believe you know what the outcome of that will be is just one more thing that we have done over all of these years trying to rid ourselves of what we imagine to be the problem. The outcome of it is actually, I don't know what the outcome of it is. The outcome of it is distinct and unique to each individual, the way this plays out. But what I do know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is that if you will try with all your heart just to look at you, just you, not self, not I, not me, just you. You, I, call it I, if you're comfortable with that. If you will do everything you can do to just get the most fleeting glimpse of that, everything will come out right. And you will see, I promise you, from my heart, because I am pretty well versed in spiritual matters myself, you will see from this side what they were trying to do. You will see exactly, and it has n- is nothing whatsoever what it looks like from this side. Just look at you. You are here, are you not? You're absolutely certain of that. What makes you so certain of that? 
Look for that. You. You. The same as you were when you were a child. Well, I, I have actually, um, like, I, I think of a couple moments of, like, self-reflective moments of being a teenager or pre-teenager, mm-hmm. standing on grandmother's lawn or something. And so I, I'm doing that. And it felt, did it, is it not true so, that you felt the same way then as you do now? Yeah. Exactly okay. the same. Yeah. So that then that will practice. bring you home. I promise you, it'll bring you home. And there's no problem with the appearance of these uh, metaphors and ideas about what's happening and so forth. And it, you can you can become ensnared with them and involved with them and so forth, and it won't hurt you. It won't prevent this work from having its way with you. It, but it's not necessary either. Yeah, I just I just feel like sometimes I whatever, have an experience, and I go, oh, that sounds like what I read. Yes, of course. Yes, it's not, of course. I don't feel like I'm trying to, you know, I mean, I'll read, well, <laughs> so it's not like I'm, I'm saying, okay, I'm going to, like, kind of emulate fake until I make it. I don't feel that's what okay, I'm Okay, that's good. Know? And, yeah, and but, it's natural, yeah. and this is what I'm speaking of when I say that as time goes on, as you see those teachings from here, rather than from here, these, this will come to you. You'll say, oh, that's what they were talking about. And that will become more and more clear and less and less complicated as time goes on. Do you follow me? Oh, sure. Yeah. Is it helpful at all? Um. <laughs> uh, just... Uh... When I, I guess when you say you know to look at you, you know to look at you. I mean, it just it's like uh, I just don't quite know what that means or something. But so. you, but you do, because you just related to me how you have had these moments of self-reflection where you have recalled what it felt like to be you as a teenager. Just today or yesterday. I'm starting right. well, to, that's to, it. Use, to employ that method. That's yeah. it. You are, okay. th- that's exactly and what I I'm asking sort of, you to do. Okay, yeah, it's the same. It's the same. So you're on, you're on so. the right track. Okay. <laughs> do, do you, do, really? Do you really well, see well, I will keep doing that. I okay. can do that. That's all I I will ask. do that. I can do that. That seems like a good thing. Uh, you know, so that's all I And you'll say. see what they meant in Mandaka. And it's just a it's just a story. It's like a poetry. It's like poetry. It's not a a uh, like factual representation of what a, the actual fact is. It evokes a yeah. feeling. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's the main thing. So I want to talk to you. Stick with me, okay? <laughs> oh, sure. Okay. Thank you. You're very <coughs> welcome. And then you. The persistence of, uh, of uh, the burden, it's a burden. Spiritual understanding is a burden. And the persistence of that burden is uh, remarkable. Hi, Giles. Hi, John. How are you doing? I'm good. good. Um, this may be quick. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have a question so much. I just wanted to say before we're going to have to leave off of this. Um, before I before I leave, just wanted to check in and say that uh, I'm not really that into the vichara right now. That's okay. Um, Are you happy? Yeah, pretty happy. That's okay. Um, I guess I feel a slight sense of um, sort of underwhelm. And disappointment. At what? At nothing. Just disappointment in general. Just like, you know, expecting the spiritual thing to be like all cosmic fireworks and Mm -hmm. explosions and consciousness Mm -hmm. and stuff. And, you know, when you look this way, there's just nothing and it's just, oh well, you know. I I guess that's why I'm not into it so much right now because I'm kind of just a little... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that happens. 
it's uh, I'll tell you this though if and it sounds to me like that it's actually the case that you have looked because uh, this is not an uncommon report uh, it's not even an uncommon it seems to me I've heard this in this retreat already oh, yes. or twice uh, I tell you this Charles if it is true that you have have done this work that'll pass that's just one more We are so persuaded that there is a problem. We are so persuaded that there is something wrong with our lives, that the discovery that there actually is nothing wrong with our lives can seem like a letdown. You know, I mean, so much. We invest so much into the solving of this problem. When we, when the problem begins to disappear, where'd it go? Wait a minute, where'd it go? This isn't any fun. I liked it better when I was all melodramatic and shit. If there is a problem, it's, the story is that it's, it's like this here in my gut. It's, it's, it's a burden, but it's like my past, something from my past that I carry here. And, um, when it sort of comes up into consciousness, it has a tendency to, um, you know, make me and others around me miserable for a while, and and I I do get terribly um, down on myself about that. Um, that's really the the only thing. These are all effects. They're all symptoms. There is no particular problem. It is it's part of the work we do to try to protect ourselves and to free ourselves from the, the underlying senselessness of human existence to localize the, our sense that there's something wrong into particular events or particular memories or particular stupidities that I have uh, enacted in the past or in the present or something. It's, it's, in our, it's the way we work. And the reason for that is because the, the, uh, the energy that arises from the the sense that there's something wrong that needs fixing, it has the purpose of identifying what's good, identifying what's bad, so that they get, so that we can figure out how to keep what's good and get rid of what's bad. Now, the the fact is that there is absolutely nothing wrong. There isn't. There never has been anything wrong ever. But the 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 habitual uh, behavior patterns and traits that have been deployed over time to help us and protect us and make us safe and open to to satisfaction, they continue because they're effects. They're mechanical. They cause nothing. They're just mechanical. So the reemergence of this thing in your gut about something in the past and so forth is is uh, as you see. It's a repetition. It's something that has occurred again and again and again as the effort to identify what the problem is and what needs to be done about it settles on that. And that will continue until it doesn't. It actually, actually, if you look and see, you will see that even when that is fully present and fully in your face and even when it is triggering other patterns of behavior and traits of uh, of, uh, relationship and so forth, even when all that is occurring, you will see that actually nothing has happened to you. Nothing. It's just thought. It really can't touch you. But I can't talk you out of it. it. Nobody can talk you out of it. Nobody can find a way to make that go away. You've been unable to make it go away for all of your life. You're not going to succeed in making it go away by wishing it would go or employing some kind of a strategy or tactic to throw it away or to fulfill it or any of that kind. What makes it go away is the erasing, the subtraction of the cause of it, the cause of the sense of it as being some horror thing that's going to destroy you or whatever. The cause of that, when that goes, that behavioral trait will also go. 
Not immediately, perhaps, but over time you'll just lose interest in it. As it becomes self it is self-evident that it doesn't hurt you. You're still here. It's still the same. You haven't changed. You're exactly the same as you always were. So as that self-evident reality asserts itself, your interest in this sensation and you're placing it within the category of this and that and the other thing just goes away. And when your interest goes away, it goes. Because it's easy at times to see that I've, I've never changed, but just attention gets drawn back into the drama. It's okay. It will until it doesn't. But really. And there's, it could take time. You know, maybe there's a little fear there about losing. What am I? <laughs> what am I going to do with echoes? <laughs> I know it's insane. That's right. But but all of this thing, all of these things are springing up, really, as a result of doing this work. Even the dissatisfaction with the results are a way are springing up as a result of doing this work, and it'll have its way in the end. Whether you want to let go of it or don't want to let go of it, it'll be gone. That's the truth. And it won't be anything special. It won't be any big deal. I mean, that's part of it, you know. I really yeah. recognize it. The fact that it's not a big deal is it's kind of a frightening very thing. very disappointing. I mean, I've been... Uh, <laughs> really, it's disappointing. I thought this was a big old deal that I was involved with here. And, you know, when you were saying yesterday about when you realize that misery's gone, like there's no big party or anything, you know. Yeah, oh, yeah. it's just... That's disappointing too. Yeah. I was kind of looking forward to the party. It's disappointing from here, where you are. It is, re- it is finally revealed to be what you've always wanted. The, the, that's the fact. What seems now to be mundane and pedestrian and not worth striving for, it's always been not worth striving for. What's worth striving for is getting rid of this problem that I know is here, after all. But what has seemed to be mundane and pedestrian and boring will make itself known to you as a magical mystery toward the like of which you cannot imagine. (laughs) Really. (laughs) Nothing changed. That's why, that's, that's why it appears again and again in the spiritual teachings, this really uh, incomprehensible assertion that Nothing changes. That samsara and nirvana the same. That the far shore and the shore you leave the same. That's why that continues to appear, this really aggravating and incomprehensible assertion that as it is now is as it will be, and that's exactly what you want. Who can make sense of that? Thanks. Okay. Stick with it. In fact, I don't, the other thing is that, as far as I can tell, once it starts, then nothing you can do anyway. You can, you know, bemoan it and whine about it and stuff, but <laughs> the end is certain. Okay? Good. John. <sighs> Every once in a while when I'm listening to a podcast that you've done, um, besides the thought form that's coming through, I get this overwhelming... I, I, sometimes I just cry because it feels like there's such an unselfishness here well, I know it. It didn't feel like it. I know that there is a full-on unselfishness, this willingness to share what it happens to be, whatever the, whatever happens to be the podcast happens to be about. You know, and, and coming to a retreat and watching watching you and Carla, the the intensity that you put into this and your willingness to just keep doing this. Um, 
you know, the only word I can see is unselfishness. You know, it's just full on unselfishness. And, um, and it got me thinking about how uh, I got involved with a program uh, 15 years ago that the, the main um, concept in this program is that selfishness and self centeredness was the root of my problem, you know, mm. and that all I had to do was. Fix that. Yes, fix it. Get rid of it. And yet, I, you know, and I see examples of unselfishness. So apparently, there's something going on here. You know, unselfishness is a real thing. Here's the thing: your nature is uh, free, open, and generous. That's your nature. Benevolent. That's your nature. The, the uh, strategies and tactics and so forth that are deployed in the interest of protecting you from or helping you or doing something to, to enhance you in the face of what is imagined to be the problem of human life uh, are have characteristics that seem to be Selfish and self-centered and and uh, self-serving and and because they are, they're all clustered around the idea that you are trapped here in a life that is filled with danger and promise, that the promise is unlikely to be fulfilled and the danger is likely to to materialize. The and that the most important thing about this life is doing whatever is possible to enhance you and to protect you. That's the, the nature of these, uh, these routines that arise in, in compliance with the idea that there's something wrong, something that needs to be fixed, something that needs to be gotten rid of. And as time has gone on in this species among us, we have, as I said, like people have happened upon the actual nature, their actual nature, the actual fact that there is nothing wrong, the actual fact that there, it is impossible for them to be damaged or enhanced in any way whatsoever. And because of the human limitations of human comprehension of what's going on, they, for the most part, have described to us what is missing, what goes away, what it actually feels like to be free and happy and at home in your own skin. One of the things that it feels like is there's no sense of selfishness. There's no sense of the need to constantly be referring to some creature that is at danger and kind of whimpering and wishing it were free and stuff like that. There's no sense of that anymore. That's not it's not a uh, the addition of some characteristic of selflessness. It's a subtraction of the appearance of the need to protect an individual creature. And we have, for all of these thousands of years, been trying to get rid of, for example, get rid of selfishness. We have invented a great number of techniques and practices and and mantras and, and all kinds of things geared to rid us of the, the self-protective instinct, the ins instinct to serve self rather than others, at the expense of others if need be. Never has succeeded. It's never had the slightest uh, hope of succeeding and actually bringing an end to human misery. Because that manifestation of what appears to be self-centeredness and self-service is itself an effect. It's a symptom. It's not the cause of anything. And the, you can't get rid of a symptom without getting rid of the cause. And the cause is precisely this underlying, unexamined, unconscious assumption that there's something that needs to be done, something that needs to be fixed something that needs to be gotten, 
something that needs to be gotten rid of. And when that goes, so too, eventually, not instantaneously, but eventually, go all of the characteristics and traits and routines and so forth that comprise the, the, the feeling of being self-centered, of self-service, of, of uh, anger, of aggression, of hatred of others, of avarice, of all those. They just go. Just don't show up anymore. And what's revealed is your actual nature, which has no, nothing to protect, nothing to enhance, nothing to be gotten rid of, nothing to be held on to. That's just the actual fact of the matter. It's the case. So it's not the addition of something. It's not the, the acquisition of some characteristic. It's the subtraction of characteristics. <clears throat> I knew it would be that easy. And it's inevitable. Okay. Good work. You're doing good. You know, the Buddhist... Uh, the concept of nirvana is interesting because nirvana actually means uh, kind of subtraction. It doesn't mean some something that is acquired or attained, some place or state or something that is that comes to replace what's present now or move you to some other area. It actually refers to the snuffing out of something, the snuffing out, the subtraction. And what is snuffed out, what is subtracted, is the, the misunderstanding that holds that you are in danger here, that you are that you are at the mercy of this life, that you are at the mercy of thought and sensation and relationship and understanding. That's what's snuffed out. And when that's snuffed out, then things are as they have always been. You are as you have always been. Life unfolds, that is, as it has always unfolded, in compliance to the circumstances in which these characteristics and qualities manifest. Only the circumstances then are missing the sense that there's something that needs to be done, and something that needs to be gotten rid of, and something that needs to be acquired. Hi. Hi, John. You have often instructed us to use all our innate intelligence to look. And um, so I'm trying to do that. And uh, when kind of continuing on a conversation of yesterday when we were talking about we're not looking to see but we're using this attention There's something that baffles me, it's the following. In any wording that you're using, whether it's look at yourself, taste yourself, the one common thing that I can see in it is is attention. I'm using my attention to look or to taste or to, to, to listen. Now, this attention is, is my mind, it's my, my brain function. Well, perhaps. Perhaps, okay. Well, it's, it's something, that, it's your comes mind. That's it's for something sure. that comes and goes. For, yes, right. Right. So what I'm baffled about is how can something that comes and goes see that which does not come and go? And what is this attention? Could you talk about that? Describe that? It's attention. Attention is a characteristic of human consciousness. It's a, it is, I suspect it may be in its, uh, in its uh, strength and, and force. It may be unique in, at least in, among, in this world, this arising of attention. My sense of it is that it is the same 
energetic arising that gives rise to speech and thought. It is, it is, a, it is a characteristic of human consciousness that allows allows it to to see things and identify things and and discern between one thing and another in a world in which really there is no particular difference between one thing and another, right? So it's a it's a tool that comes along with the uh, appearance of human consciousness. It is in the absence of danger and uh, and promise, in the absence of those two poles, it is a uh, kind of a minor element in the human mind. It, 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 when it's called upon, it does its job. It allows me, for example, to pay attention to the problems that I'm now having with constructing the new website, and the little details about how things don't quite come together right and, and things of that nature. It allows me to pay attention to what I'm doing when I'm cooking dinner or, or uh, things of that kind. But other than that, it's just kind of a minor thing. It's a, it's a thing that's useful, that has, has a value and, has a, and, and can, uh, can help the life. Right. When it's hijacked by the deep, unexamined assumption that there's something wrong, something terribly wrong here, something that I have to figure out what it is, and I have to figure out what to do about it, and what I need to get rid of, and what I need to keep, then it becomes like a monster. And, and uh, its force becomes intensified because of the apparent, and like I'm, this is a story I'm weaving. It's of no more consequence than the Mundaka Upanishad. I am not saying anything that is literally the case. I am trying to evoke my sense of what is occurring here. So, so take it with a grain of salt the way I say it. When it's hijacked by this uh, sense of uh, promise and danger, then it becomes much more intensified. It becomes I'm kind of a monster that looks here and grabs a hold of that, pushes away that, and worries about that, and so forth. I think it is, as I said, I think it is at its at its its, its source. I think it is a characteristic that has uh, arisen with the evolving of the human species that. Uh, that gives rise to speech. Speech and thought are pretty much the same thing. They, you know, thoughts come, we don't know from where they come, but they seem to come from me. The same as speech. I speak to you and I don't know what the next word is going to be as it comes out. Well, that is uh, an aspect of that attention that I speak of. <clears throat> it's doing as it's doing its work of trying to save you, whether to save you by enhancing you, allowing you to transcend or transform, or to save you by protecting you, by identifying threats and danger and so forth, it is, it is operating that what it has been hijacked by is an absolutely false and unexamined assumption. It's an assumption that we don't even realize is in place. It's just what seems to be the case. Life is dangerous. Life sucks. Since we do have some control over it, and since it seems to be the only thing we can have anything to say about, like it feels like I can determine, decide to put my attention here rather than there, since it seems that we have some control over it, and since it's its main characteristic is its capacity to to perceive things, this and that, good and bad and so forth. And since I can control it, it turns out without knowing why exactly any of that is the case, that I actually can turn it inward, looking for its this from which it arises. And it will see things. You will see things with your attention as you do that. 
You will see sensational phenomena. You will see all kinds of things as you try to turn inward with your attention. It will also come to pass that by hook or by crook, by luck or by uh, intelligence, it will also come to pass that given the, the strength of your determination to perceive your actual nature, that it will touch that. I mean, you're everywhere. You can't be avoided. It tries to avoid you because you're not interesting. But you're everywhere. And once that internal intention is in place, it will absolutely stumble upon you. And and the, the critical moment is a moment when there is actual recognition that what's seen is you. No matter how fleeting, no matter how that recognition may even be not noticed, that momentary recognition is all that it takes. You're recognizing your actual nature using the only tool you have, which is this attention. And the recognition of your actual nature totally gives the lie to the whole sense that there's something that needs to be fixed. It's, it's just the case. If you can't, it can't survive. And it's also the case that, and why that is possible? Who knows? It, who knows? But it's also the case, and this is simply uh, from my own experience and from the experience of people who have reported to me, it's also the case that once that occurs, once that first recognition occurs, this movement of attention toward the reality that it seeks to serve happens again and again and again. And I always tell people, do this whenever it occurs to you to do so. This isn't a duty. This isn't a, you know, like it's not like you're required to do this at a certain number of times or at a certain time of day. But what I'm expecting when I tell people to do it whenever it occurs to them to do so that the fact that it occurs to them to do so is because of the fact that it has already occurred. You follow that? I do. Just earlier you said you're, you're, you're seeing with your attention. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, Fair enough? close as I can get. Yeah. Right. right. Like you're looking at things. Right. That's what you're doing. You're looking at things. And, and when you're looking at things with the desperate mission, to fulfill or to save you, then that looking becomes really unpleasant. And would that be what you mean by using your natural capabilities? Your natural intelligence. Your natural intelligence. Capacity for discernment. Once you start trying to turn inward, which is not as easy as it sounds, right. there's nothing inward except you. Right. Nothing. Only you are inward, and once you, and once you uh, try to turn inward, right, you will find yourself settling on this thing or that thing or another thing, and it's the natural intelligence and capacity for discernment that will permit you to move away from those things, looking further, further, more inward. Until there's a recognition. Until there's a recognition, and then the, the same pattern may continue over time. But once the recognition is had, the end is certain. Beautiful. Thanks, John. Helpful? Yes. Okay. One more, and somebody back here. You're going to have to wait till tomorrow, I'm afraid, Helen. <laughs> Who was it back here? Okay, you then. Roberta, I thought it was somebody else, but. Well, that's what you wanted to tell me off? Okay. <laughs> I like talking to you. Oh, I, like, I like talking to you, too. Okay. <laughs> um, this was something that just rose in me listening to Giles. So I just want, I'm going to talk about what, what rose in me. I was really excited to hear you say what you said, that you were bored with this, or you didn't, whatever you said. What did you say? I'm all right. Well, because, and this is what it, it made me think of, for lack of a better way, is that that's fantastic. Because yes. this is a lie. He's lying to us. 
This is a big lie. Because the only way he can tell the truth is to lie. Because he can't tell the truth. So he's lying to you. So one of many responses to a lie is, you know, good for you to know that you're not into it anymore. Nobody can tell you the truth. And until you realize that only you can do it, everybody is lying to you. But he has to lie to us to tell us the truth. That's, that's the only way. <laughs> so his, you know, who's, so there are lies and there are lies, but they're all just so silly it doesn't matter. So, so, so here, it's, to me, here's, here's, here's the thing, is that, is that, um, The thing that I hear John suggesting we do is so funny because it can't be done. It just can't be done in a sense that, to me, that, that the thing you, that, 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 that <coughs> is ultimately in the end, it, it can't be done because it's, it's already be happening. But until that moment, th then, uh, then this is, f for me, a fantastic thing of, turning the attention toward it because until the, the, the you realize that that can't it, you can't do it well well then it's it's poof that then the truth is there but it's a big lie until then but but I, I can I'll just say one little thing that happened to me many many years ago I was in therapy with someone for a long time I was really ragefully angry at this man one day that I was in therapy with and uh, I was sitting on my back porch, and I was just having a rant with myself. He thinks he, it was Jungian therapy. And I said to myself, he thinks he's Jung. He sails a boat. He, uh, I was just in a rant. And suddenly, I was f really in this. I heard a voice. And this voice said, so what? And it doesn't matter. You know, the voice thing, don't get hung up on that. It, it's just it was what it said to me. It said, so what? And I got it. I got that this therapist was just him, like me. And he was lying to me, essentially. He, he didn't, you know, we, we don't mean to be lying all over the place. I mean, yes and no. But, but it didn't matter that he was what he was. And at that moment, I could receive everything from him that he was what's happening. So, so it's, it feels to me like... Like, you know, I was pissed at you today because I'm sick of you telling us how inept you are. It's like, I can't do this very well. You know, I'm, I'm like, okay, just stop telling me how inept you are, okay? And then I was really pissed off at, at the spiritual <laughs> ghetto thing. It's like, well, why the hell did I come? You know, and, and I was sitting there listening to all this, and it was kind of funny to me because I, I knew I was, something was happening. I was in it. And so I just also heard this, so what? So what that this is, so what? And, and I, I, I said, so what's the problem? And, and then, boom, then there's that, <laughs> that thing that Mo and I were talking about at dinner last night. She asked me about the negative and the positive thing. And I said, well, you know, for me, it's like this. It, it's not really any negative. There's no, it's not really any positive. It, it's that when, if I were to imagine that, when things fall away and, and it starts to feel like I, you know, all the things I would say I was aren't there anymore, I, I become very solid. Very what? Solid. Solid. You are solid. Right. Yes, you are solid as a rock. Yes, exactly. That's, that's, that, so that's, that's the thing that when, 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 uh, when, when, uh, <laughs> when you realize it's a big lie, it's nothing but the truth. And so it's just a fantastic thing. That's what I felt. It's a fantastic thing that you're not interested in it. I... 
because I think that it makes you more interested in it. You. <laughs> that was my experience listening to him. So. Let me tell you something. Okay. I am not lying. I know. I am not. What I speak of is my actual experience. It is absolutely possible for you to get a brief moment of recognition of your actual nature. That's absolutely possible. And that solves it all. That's the God's honest truth. I am not... The words that I say are not exactly what it is that I am suggesting to you, because words are abstractions. But I am not lying. This is the truth. If you get that recognition of your actual nature, all problems are solved. And it won't be a passing moment of relief that recurs from time to time in the proper circumstance. It will be an absolute, intimate, An, an erasing of the boundary between you and your life, between you and these characteristics. An end to that. An end to the, to the ironic alienation that, that is our plight. That'll be over. But I enjoy your Yeah, I'm sure it feels like entertainment, but, you know, it's... I'm an entertainer. Exactly. I sometimes tell Carla I could be a stand-up comic. Yeah. Yeah. But that pays better. <laughs> yeah, it's... um. But I'm not lying, Roberta. It's a... To me, it, it, it can't... It's what I was talking about last night. This This... Or Friday night, whatever night it was. This thing has always been for me. I'm not saying that that it's what I, I it's what I said, and I know you heard what I said because you, you, we were sitting here. It's true. I have to go back to the example. If I were, if a person's plopped on the earth, you know, the, the thing of hunger. We we imagine that we're hungry, but hunger has its own. I imagine this thing of me knowing me that it's something me can do, but it's 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 done. It's, it, well, it is done. Yeah. It is done. The idea that you don't know you is false. Right. That's the lie. Right. That's not true. Right. And that's, that's the case. You are never, ever uh, not conscious of you. Never. The, the, what's, mi what's missed in the focusing of attention on the solution of problems is the recognition of that as being you. And the recognition of that being you erases the need to focus attention to solve the problems of life. That's it essentially what it is that I'm suggesting. And that's all. Nothing more. Not any prediction as to what the outcome is in the way this personality changes or moves or has its being or anything else. But that the recognition, the, the momentary recognition of the, your actual nature, conscious recognition of it, your actual nature, puts an end to the focusing of attention on, is this right? Is this wrong? Can I do this? Can I do that? What's here? What do I need to do? Why is this funny? Why is this... just puts an end to it. Erases the separation between you and your life. That's, that's the thing. That's the thing right there. That's that. That's that. That's, that's, that's the crux right there. That's right. For me. It's yeah. the ironic separation. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And that goes. Yeah. I'm very familiar with that.
that's that's the thing and and I guess what I'm speaking to is that I didn't realize that in that ironic separation that <laughs> I was trying so hard to do what's already happening. I know. I know. It's stunning. It is stunning. It's stunning. And it's you know, and I do get, I, it, it is stunning. It's like, what the hell? You know, it's, it's, but it's this, this cavern that's been going on forever of, I thought that was a thing to get away from. Yes. I yes, thought that that's was right. the problem, but that is actually the thing. That's right. That's right. And that is like, I mean, that takes my breath away. It's Mine shocking. Too. Mine too. Mine too. I worked all my life to, just like you, and couldn't. How can that be? How, how can, can that, that be? be? That that. How can that be? It's, it's. I mean, it. I should. Well, how can you even talk about it? It's like, wait, what? It's like, oh, just take all the error right out of me. Yes, that's right. I know. Yeah, it makes you laugh. It makes you do this. It's like, where? <laughs> what could I have been thinking? What could, what? <laughs> How did that happen? Yeah. How on earth did that happen? Just an accident. Yeah. Thank you. Stay in touch with me, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Giles. <laughs> Thank you, Giles. <laughs> okay, we're done here. Uh, we're out of time, out of tape, and, uh, and so forth. I'm not going to say much because, uh, because we just don't have any time to say much. Except that I love you. I love you all. And I am as always, grateful for your presence here and for your willingness. We're on the right track. And I'll see, some of you I'll see tonight. I don't know exactly who, but some of you I'll see tonight. Those of you who are going to see me tonight, I just want to say in advance that I never have anything to say in these evening meetings. This is entirely up to you guys. Whatever you bring, that's what we'll talk about. But I don't come prepared for anything. I'm just kind of a... Anyway. So I'll see some of you tonight. I'll see the rest of you tomorrow. And sleep well. Look at yourself. Thank you.